We're going to talk today about the partnership between schoolhouse and courthouse, uh, hopefully hitting on a number of the issues uh, that you have uh, that come to your attention. Uh, let's just get a little bit of show of who we've got here so we can be sure that we're meeting everyone's needs. I'm going to kind of visually go around the courtroom. Are there any parent attorneys here? Not oh, one. Uh, guardian ad litem attorneys. Okay, guardian ad litem volunteers or staff. Okay, all right. Um, CLS or attorney, Office Attorney General. Okay, all right. Um, uh, looking more on the, the DJJ side of things, anyone here from the State Attorney's Office? PD? Educators. Who have I missed? Kids lawyer. Kids lawyers, of course. How dare I forget kids lawyers? Okay. DJ attorneys. Okay. All right. Judge. Okay. Excellent. Wonderful. Okay. So we seem to have the whole system here, with the exception of parents attorneys. Okay. All right, well, we're going to talk a little bit about stuff that focuses on parents, too. And um, so as you're talking with your colleagues, you can tell them that you've learned a few things that might um, help them help the parents. Okay, I think everybody's seen this. Okay. All right, so. Long before it became part of our statute, it was recognized that the educational needs of children involved in the dependency system were um, being, I want to say overlooked, but certainly not being well coordinated and well managed. And with the um, advent of some statutory changes, chapter 39, 39.0016 to be specific, um, talks about the education of children who have been abused and neglected and why it is important. Um, we know that children who are involved in the dependency system do not fare as well academically as children who are not involved in the dependency system. They have higher rates of school mobility, higher rates of absenteeism, um, higher um, incidence of retention, uh, there's a greater prevalence of children in, who are um, in ESE services, um, among others. What we know also is that they're the, the, the lows. They're not ready to start school when they enter kindergarten. They are not graduating at the same rates as their non-foster care or dependency involved peers. Uh, they are not achieving their post-secondary outcomes at the rate of non-foster care peers. So it really is a collective thing that we need to address. This is no one person's responsibility. When we look at who are educational advocates, at this point, and I imagine a lot of people have seen the Everybody's a Teacher video. Have they, has, have people, Everybody's a Teacher? Uh, as a DCF initiative, um, really looking at, it, it's everyone's responsibility to be an educational advocate. When we look at from a school system perspective, it's very challenging for a school, for a teacher, to know who they contact, who do they connect with as it relates to when a child is involved in the pregnancy system, who do they talk to. Uh, you've got a, you have a parent perhaps still involved, you have a foster parent or a caregiver involved in some way, there's a caseworker, there's a guardian at litem, there might be an attorney at litem, there might be a therapist and a case manager. There's a lot of people, and all, everyone has the educational interests of the child in, in their heart and in their mind, but when you've got a lot of people doing the same kind of task, you can almost guarantee that everyone's thinking someone else is doing. So that collaboration is just absolutely critical. We're going to go ahead and take a, um, a couple of case um, examples. So I, if you could switch, go to the back page of your handout there. We've got a handout in the back of the room.
significant school placement changes, when we have had those, the, the traumas that have uh, resulted in the child coming into care, the breaking of social relationships, whether that's with peers, with teachers, that is all having an impact also on the child's emotional and behavioral well-being. And many times those issues result in children exhibiting a variety of behaviors, which often lead to a belief system that the child is having an emotional behavioral disability that, needs, that is impacting them <coughs> educationally. And if we were looking at the child in a more trauma-informed way, we might realize that a lot of what they are, they're responding to the situation that they are in. That this is perhaps, I would say normalized, but there is a perhaps reason that we are seeing this behavior for this child. So school stability is a critical piece um, uh, that we want to assure for children that are in care. We know that when they change schools frequently, obviously they're falling behind in skill areas. They're losing those academic supports that they would have. Uh, they're losing enrichment opportunities and activities, and kids who are involved in any kind of sports. It's, it's, it's huge because the um, athletic association rules don't let you start playing football in one school and then start playing in another school uh, mid-year. Um, extracurricular activities, again, uh, relationships with adults or mentors. Uh, many times, you know, kids have teachers at school that they feel connected to which the uh, Federal Act and within Chapter 39 indicates that children who are involved in foster care should not be changing schools unless it's been determined to be in their best interest to do so. So there is a tremendous backing in terms of, of uh, legislation to promote that academic stability. And in some districts, that's easier to do than others. Um, in Broward County, which is the Fort Lauderdale area, we are an extremely um, dense um, community. We have uh, over 250 schools. Uh, we have over 250,000 students. Uh, we've got probably roughly around 600 of them in uh, licensed out-of-home care. And, um, uh, in our school system, that is. And um, we do transportation in Broward County for all of our kids, whether where the, regardless of where they move in our county to maintain that stability. Um, this school year, we did over 500 special transportation requests, so that would be maintaining children in their school that had changed placements, um, regardless of how many times that happens to them. Uh, so that they are not having to change schools. Um, and so it, that is, uh, goes a long way, of course, um, if you have a school district that has that capacity to do transportation. Um, it's not an entitlement. It's not like homeless education or the McKinney Venture Act where it is an entitlement um, for children who are homeless. For foster care, it's a best practice, not necessarily something that a district must do. Um, chapter 39 does indicate, however, that every department, DCF, because it's directed at the, uh, at the DCF um, division, has an interagency agreement with their local school system, and that that agreement addresses how they are going to manage educational stability. It doesn't make it any one entity's responsibility, but that collectively they work to, to figure that out. What is that called again? That, that legislation? The, 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 which legislation? Well, this, it keeps the child in, in the same school unless it's... Well, in chapter, 30, in chapter 39, there is language that indicates that children who should remain in their school unless it's in their best interest not to. The other piece that I mentioned was the McKinney-Vento Act, which is related to homeless education. And there is a subset within the McKinney Mental Act that refers to children awaiting foster care placement. And um, again, uh, and the language is somewhat vague. What does awaiting foster care placement mean? 
Um, and in Florida, the Department of Education has indicated that that is the child who has been removed but does not yet have a foster home placement. It would not refer to a child who had been in a foster home, ended up coming out and having to go into shelter or something temporarily and then into another home. That once the child has been uh, placed into foster care, been adjudicated and placed into foster care, then that would be no longer considered a child awaiting foster care placement. So some communities have utilized the McKinney Vento Act to help provide transportation for the students that they might have um, in their district related to foster care. Okay. Okay, now taking a look at the educational stability and the scenario that we had with Abby. Okay, question one. Should Abby have changed schools when she entered the rest of care home? No. no? Anyone says yes? Or depends? Okay. She would not have had to have changed schools. Okay. Whether it was in her best interest to would really be determined, you know, in her case. Um, in, in our county, for instance, sometimes uh, we, we can do the transportation. I was dealing with one last night that just had a change of placement. And transportation said, or we found a bus, um, it's a second grader, they're going to be picked up at 5.30 and ride with high school students. Okay? So sometimes it's not, it, it can be a challenge. So the issue becomes the transportation. Um, there was no problem with the child being able to stay in their school. But how are they going to get there? And did they want to do that for the remaining two weeks of school? Or could they figure out, you know, that where they want to use that bus service um, and or figure out another way for that child to get there? Um, ultimately, what we ended up doing, deciding was they were going to find a way for them to get there in the morning. The child would take the bus um, home in the afternoon. Um, so, um, all right. How was it to get them in the morning without curiosity? Pardon? How did you decide to get them there earlier? Oh, our community based provide, uh, care agency is going to do the driving in the morning to get them there just to, to maintain these last two weeks for them. Okay, now does Abby need to change schools again? She's leaving a rest at home and going into a foster home. <coughs> does she need to change schools this time? Doesn't need to, it depends on Right. Okay, so the school that she is now in, that she went into in the rest of home, would now be considered <coughs> a school of origin. Sometimes what we have done too is take a look at that. She's only been there for six weeks. But perhaps that school that she had been in when she was in the previous, um, previously, is a school that we would want to see about returning her to since that was really where she had some time. And again, depending on the community, that school might be, uh, it, that school might be closer to the foster home than she's in the school that she's only been in for the six weeks. So we want to look at all of those things. Which brings us to the third question. Who makes this decision? And that's usually about what that's usually about what happens. <laughs> the school says who's responsible for this decision. Um, so it really needs to be a collective decision. The schools have information that I mean they may I've had schools contact me and be so adamant that this child needs to stay with us. This is their connection, this is and all of these things when someone else is looking at changing their school. You know, a foster parent may want to have a child at a school that's closer to them. Um, sometimes people look at that and say, well, that's just convenience for them. But as a parent, if you've got kids and you know you've got to pick three different kids up at three different times, and you've got this and this going on, driving 15 miles for one of the 
kids, you know, to order to go participate in school activities there can be challenging. So they certainly, foster parents certainly have input on that. The caseworker may have input on that. Guardian of Lytton may have input on that. Um, the parents of the child. You know, parents have oftentimes, you know, gone to or maybe moved into a particular area because that's the school that they wanted their kids to go to. Or they have applied to have their children in a, in a particular program, a magnet program, <coughs> or something like that at a particular school. And when you give that up, you're giving up all that work and that program that that child was in there. So it really needs to be a collective decision, looking at all of the factors um, that we had mentioned back in the effects of mobility um, to determine whether in this particular child's interest should they stay at their school or go. And for some kids, that, I had, that bus ride might have been fine. For other kids, the bus ride is not. OK, taking a look at parent, and, and I'm sorry that we don't have any parent attorneys um, here, but here's a couple of uh, definitions. When we look at how Florida statutes in education define parent, it's either or both parents of a student, any guardian of a student, and by guardian it's referring to legal guardian, not guardian at, at litem, <coughs> any person in a parental relationship to the student, or any person exercising supervisory authority over a student in place of a parent. That can be a lot of different people. That covers a step parent, that covers a grandparent who's got the child living with them, that covers the official court legal, legal guardian of a child, mom and or dad, whether they live together or not. So, so you can see that it's a very encompassing definition. Hence the confusion that schools have when we talk about the parent doing this and the parent doing that, when it can be any one of these people, it can be very confusing for a school. <coughs> when we talk about children with disabilities, the law, however, gets a little more specific. And when we're talking about disabilities in education, the natural or adoptive parent of a child is defined as parent. A foster parent meets the definition of parent. A guardian, and it gets very specific and says, but not the state. So not in the DCF, not the child welfare agency, a community-based care provider. A person acting in the place of the natural or adoptive parent, for example, a grandparent, a step parent, a relative, and a surrogate parent. All of those people meet the definition of parent. The little asterisk next to the natural or adoptive parent states, and this is in federal law, that the, this, the parent always has first rights, if you will. And this, when they are attempting to exercise those rights. So if you have a foster parent and the child's parent, and the child's parent is there and involved, they have the educational decision-making rights as it relates to special education or ESC. I know the session that I was in yesterday, there was someone who had asked about it, that they were a surrogate parent and that there was some question at the school level about whether they had the authority to serve as parent or whether the child's parent did. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what it means to be a surrogate parent. How many people in here are um, trained surrogate parents? Great, okay. You have active cases? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so looking at that list that we had, this is kind of a, a yes and no list to help guide some decisions and understanding the process. 
who can sign the consents and IEPs of the parents to make educational decisions. Were uh, many of you in the session yesterday that Ann did on the special education? Okay, she talked a lot, you heard a lot about, again, yeah, it's all, all relates to parent, 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 parent. The parent has all the rights in special, in special education. So when you have children in the care, who, who can serve as that parent? So on the, under the yes list, it kind of is a, is a repeat of what had been listed before, the parent, the foster parent, the legal guardian, a relative or non-relative caregiver, or a surrogate parent. That leaves the no's to be the caseworker. Caseworkers under no circumstance can serve as parent for ESE purposes. The guardian at litem, as a guardian at litem. For those of you that are both guardian at litem and surrogate parents, sometimes you have your guardian at litem hat on, and sometimes you have your surrogate hat on. But in the case of pure and simple guardian at litem, no. The shelter or group home provider, anyone working for an uh, agency, cannot serve as a parent. A therapeutic foster parent may not serve as parent. Why is that? What, well, A, I'll say A, it's because in Chapter 39 specifically says therapeutic foster parents mm -hmm. cannot. But the reason is that there is a potential conflict of interest. Therapeutic foster parents are under a contractual relationship with their agency. And so if they they are not there, it's not a simple room and board situation. The state defense says that foster parents can because they're getting a room and board situation. The therapeutic foster parents have a contractual relationship um, with that agency. They get a, a a compensation beyond a, the regular state room and board rate. Okay, residential care provider cannot, and an attorney at litem cannot. Yes? If a student is in a therapeutic foster home, who's going to sign the consent? One of these people over here. But they're their foster parents. Then, then they wouldn't be able to. So if the parent is not available for whatever reason, TPR or whereabouts unknown, they can't. If, it, if the therapeutic foster parent cannot, then that's a child that's going to need to have a surrogate parent appointed to them. Yes. And this is not actually a question, but just to clarify for me, it's not that those people can't go. They can't participate, they just don't make the final decision. So Correct. if they go and their their input is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. At those meetings though, um, especially in my experience with therapeutic foster parents, um, they often want those students evaluated for Don't they want the students, I'm sorry. They want the students evaluated for exceptional student education. So um, usually they are at the meeting with no one else. And um, they're not being able to sign consent. <laughs> well, they, and they certainly, as as it was mentioned, all everyone has a piece of information that is going to be very important to meeting the educational needs of that child. And certainly, that therapeutic foster parent who's there every day with that child is seeing things that other parties, including the child's own parent, are not there to see. But the law does get very specific when it comes to special education. That no matter what has happened with a child in the dependency system, unless that natural or adoptive parent's rights have been terminated or limited in some way, the court enters a, a finding that the parent is not permitted to make educational decisions. Um, but they maintain the legal rights under IDEA even though their child is involved in the dependency system. So again, all of these people have an important piece of it, but the relationship between the education system and the parent is going to identify which of those people is the person that can serve as a parent, as the decision maker. Yeah, I'll go there's one up here and then you go there. We'll talk about that in just one second. Okay. Yes. So, 
So I'm an educational surrogate um, in three counties that surrounding here. And each county says some people don't care that I'm the, the surrogate parent in some districts. Some say you, you're the only person that does matter. So how can we get all the school districts together so they know this information because I've got basically now IEPs that uh, need to be amended, I guess, because they got... Uh, you, you were appointed as your train, your, I'm going to raise your hands here, your train surrogate. You were appointed to that student path through, through the court. The court, there's, so there's a court order yes. appointing you by yes. name as the surrogate yes. parent to and South. And I'm telling you, in Seminole County, right above us, they they didn't care at all. Um, I mean, they wanted the case manager to sign. I was I was like a uh, nothing. Um, not being familiar with the, the structure in those in those particular districts, I can tell you that again, statute indicates that a surrogate parent who has been appointed in one school district anywhere in Florida has to can transfer and be, and is that child's surrogate. We have to recognize it. If you one of your children come to Broward County, we have to honor and accept that you have been appointed as surrogate so what I need parent. To do is print that out and take it to the school district. Yes. School district, basically. Yes. Yes. If you're willing to, and if you're willing to do that, some might not be able to distance, but we all, one of the things that we always do in Broward when we have a child come in from another county is in, want to inquire as to whether they have a surrogate parent, you know, say Palm Beach County to the north of us. And is that person still willing and able to, to fulfill that role in our county um, because we, you have, it has to be accepted. Uh, likewise, when a surrogate is appointed by, whether the surrogate is appointed by the school district, and that's why I had asked you because you could be appointed as a surrogate by the school district or by the court. Respectively, each has to accept each other's appointment. The school system has to accept, if you've been appointed as a surrogate by the court, we, the school system has to accept that as you being the surrogate. Likewise, if you were appointed by Seminole County School District, the court would have to accept that, that you were the appointed surrogate. Yeah, I just was going to make a statement that in, in a non- um, aggressive way, I would call the uh, general counsel of Seminole County and tell them that at a certain school they don't seem to understand it. And um, first of all, I know those folks, but I just think if you do that, it'll clear it up. Um, you know, I mean, a lot of times in schools they don't they don't understand the details. Um, and and so in a non-confrontational way, I would just say, you know, it seems like I don't, and I want to do my job. So can you help me out? And they're very open folks. At least they're most people are. But I, that's what I would do. Then. Yes, one other question in the back. Um, I just wanted to, as an assistant, because I am CLS here in Orange County, and I work both in Osceola and Seminole, that I would suggest that also that if she's not comfortable with making that contact herself, um, to feel free to contact the CLS attorney on the case, or the guardian ad litem attorney, either here in Orange County, or, um, <laughs> or in Seminole Osceola. County, and oh, Osceola, and ask them to make that contact for you and explain it to the school, to the school principal if necessary, because that's part of our job. Okay, one, one more and two left. Okay, from the slide before, the list, is it in order of preference? I mean, because I've also found that um, in dependency <coughs> cases, when the parent is not TBR, there are some school districts that even if the court, the court, they, they won't, they don't want to appoint the surrogate parent because the natural parent's still around, but oftentimes we know that that parent is showing up now and then, asking to drug school, and to show up and care about the IP stuff. And so how far and fast is this level? I mean, do they, is it? Uh, Legally, if the parent is around and you have contact with the parent, you cannot appoint a surrogate. Unfortunately. 
mean, the, the law really says that you appoint a surrogate either when the TPR has occurred and or when you've done due diligence and you can't find the parent. Now, you know, DCF, all the time, I use that term to mean everybody, you know, on the CBCs, but DCF usually does their own due diligence. So the school system can accept that, but they have to have that information because our law says we have to do due diligence too to find them. And so if DCF has done it and the parent isn't around, but you know, there's a little parent, you can appoint them. But there has to be the in between parents. No, the in between parent, unfortunately, um, there's no way to Because I know sometimes you start to make that best interest finding uh, because we're not quite yet to TPR or something. Unless the judge removes the decision making authority for education, they can do that. They can, they can take the, the decision making authority away from the parent for education. Okay. In, order, in, in, in order, they do that, a surrogate then can be appointed. Okay. But they would have to make, make that finding that there is, what they basically have to do is make a finding that there isn't any, there aren't any of these people who can who are sort of ready, willing, and able, okay. for lack of a better description, to, to assume that role. And if, if, it's, if there isn't any of those four, then the, let's, the, ch the child could have a surrogate here. Okay, good suggestion. Okay. All right. So a surrogate parent, just to clarify for those who are not as familiar with it, assumes the role everywhere in the law that would say parent, the surrogate parent now assumes that role of the educational decision maker. Again, we're talking about for students who have an dis educational disability or who are suspected of having an educational disability. A surrogate parent is not for a child who is uh, acting ungovernable and truant and not going to school and there isn't a suspected disability involved. It's not a, they're not an educational mentor. They're not uh, a, a tutor. They're not just a general advocate. They are specific for students that are, have a disability or are suspected of having a disability. So throughout that identification, evaluation, placement, and provision of services, that surrogate parent would fulfill that role of parent. A surrogate parent must meet, and then you did not list all the criteria here, you have to be a U.S. resident over 18 years of age, and you must have completed the DOE approved training to be a surrogate parent. And a guardian at litem, if they have been trained as a surrogate parent, should always be considered first under statute and as a matter of best practice. They are familiar with the child. Um, I always prefer to see a guardian at litem when possible because they know every, what's going on within the dependency case. They know whether Johnny had a visit with his parents last weekend and that's contributing to what's happening in school this week. Um, a, a surrogate who is appointed from the pool of surrogates, so to speak, who's not involved in a day-to-day -day basis with the dependency case, is not going to have all that kind of information that a guardian of light of wood. So we certainly like to see that. We, in fact, in Broward, have incorporated um, th through um, the leadership of our circuit director um, in Circuit 17, we have incorporated um, surrogate parent training into the 30-hour pre-service for all guardian and items. Um, so every month we train, I would say, roughly 25 to 30 new guardian and items. Uh, and then we also host specific events um, for uh, those who were already certified as guardian at Lytton to become educational surrogates. I think we probably trained well over to probably to, well over 250 guardian at Lytton in Broward at this point. Um, you know, the stars have to kind of align, as we say, when they're, when they're in the training because it would have to be A, that it's a child with a di disability or suspected disability, B, that there isn't a parent or foster parent that could serve, 
and see that it's a child on your caseload. So it's, there's not a prohibition from you as a guardian at Leiden and trained surrogate to serve as the surrogate on Christina's case, for instance, but you, it's all, most guardians would want to be the surrogate on the case that was their, their own case. Okay, yes? I'm excuse on this, uh, but the guardian at Leiden is not allowed to sign or consent or not as, as wearing the guardian at Leiden hat, no. Once they become a surrogate parent, are they allowed to If you are the appointed surrogate parent, just being trained as a surrogate parent doesn't make you the educational decision maker for a particular child. You would have to be appointed either by the school district as the surrogate parent for that child or by the judge as the surrogate parent for that particular child. Would that be the same referring to my colleague's question earlier? No, they may not be a surrogate parent. They could not be a surrogate parent. Okay, let's like to look at a few questions regarding parental roles. Going to the Carson siblings, who's the parent for Derek related to his everyday educational activities? Derek was our EDD student, emotional behavioral disabilities, living in a therapeutic foster home. Parental rights are intact. For, for the everyday activities. Yes, the court, in fact, could name grandma 
as the educational decision maker for the child, yes. The court in chapter 39 has a responsibility to determine who a child's educational decision maker is. And they, if they want to name grandma, and the, yeah, this is a bit of a trick question, but uh, they could name grandma. She wouldn't have to be the sur surrogate parent. Uh, and that, that, that's the question number four, is could, could maternal grandmother be appointed as the educational surrogate? It was a bit of a yes and no question. She could be appointed as his educational decision maker. If she were to be a quote, official surrogate parent, she would have to go through surrogate parent training. Okay. Are there any other questions related to the whole identification, parent involvement, surrogate piece for now? Okay. Um, what about that? Okay. One of the things that we wanted to talk about this morning is, is because there's so many um, agencies involved and people get frustrated with other agencies roadblocks, for lack of a better word. I wanted to talk a little bit about them, about some of the ones in the educational field, and for you all to hopefully realize that um, most districts don't do it just to be obnoxious and to uh, slow this process down, that they really do it because um, by law they're required to. One of the, the newer things in the last two or three years is response to intervention. Um, prior to um, evaluating a child for ESE services, um, the law talks about how children need to have um, interventions in the general education um, arena to all children so that we can determine if we can do um, interventions and not have them declared ESC. Um, <coughs> some of it is, is, to be honest with you, and, and there is also some um, there are some exceptions to this when there is emergencies or when it's very clear, particularly for EBD kids, those kinds of children, <coughs> that, that you need to move the process along. Um, but anyway, interventions are, um, are matched with children's needs. There are three tiers. Uh, the first tier are general when they're given to all students in a classroom. We're going to work with all students, maybe with visual schedules or with some level of organization. Um, tier two is when we work with individual students and it's a higher level of intervention, specifically or in small groups. And then um, tier three is for specific, specific interventions for an individual student. Generally, if you get to tier three, you need to be beginning to think about um, evaluation for ESE services. Now, something that Ann said yesterday, um, <clears throat> Well, let's talk, we'll start here first. Generally, most schools have something called a child study team. Um, uh, we call them in Broward comprehensive problem solving teams. They meet as a group. It usually is um, guidance people, uh, teachers, whatever, principals. They meet and determine needs. They determine interventions. And that group can decide immediately. They invite the parents to come, again, definition of parent, but they can invite the parents. Sometimes we have them all. We have the natural parent, we have the surrogate parent, we have the foster parent, and we have, you know, the, the foster care worker um, in Broward. We call them child advocates through ChildNet. And so um, they're all invited. We talk about progress. We want to see it's data-driven. They, they print the data out. You want to see a projection moving forward. Sometimes some kids move slower than others, but you want to have an upward projection. Um, and they need to be monitored by the, the um, comprehensive problem-solving team on a regular basis. So if you are in this, all of you can be part of this. All of you can request that this occur. You might not be able to sign the consent to actually get the evaluation done. None of these activities require consent. These are all interventions in an educational field that do not require any consent. And you all, whatever your role is, can go to the school and request that. And you get others who are involved with them to do that. Um, one of the good things about RTI is that it helps focus um, what the interventions help focus what the real questions 
regarding if we need to do an evaluation, what are those questions? Because the child might respond to some interventions and you might see that that's not an issue, but they might not respond to others. And so that's a really good thing um, that happened. As Ann talked about yesterday, RTI and, a, and an evaluation can and, and happen at the same time concurrently. <coughs> but we need to think about a couple things. I encourage this, I really do. However, to get good data, you need a good six, eight, ten weeks of collecting data to see how kids are going. And again, as Ann said yesterday, an evaluation needs to be done in 60 school days where the child is in attendance. Well, let's just say 60 school days. 60 school days is about three months. So generally, in that 60 days, you can get a good, a good data trend. And so I think it's a good idea to have them happen concurrently. For some of the disabilities, however, specifically a, a specific learning and disability, sometimes those RTI interventions take longer because you really got to hone in on what the specific disability is. So sometimes that time period takes longer than the evaluation. And if that's true, if you end up with your evaluation and you don't have the proper RTI, a district would have to deny eligibility for SLD, specific learning and disability, until they get all of that RTI gap. So I'm not discouraging you from, from having them happen concurrently, but realize if the student, if the school is really doing their due diligence and they aren't quite ready yet there, they might not be able to give the eligibility until they finish the data, which is really important. Um, there are eligibilities, again, um, Ann talked about these yesterday too, that require um, RTI to be done. Now, it is required that RTI be done, they, they request that it be done before any evaluation, but there is specific criteria in um, the State Board rules for ESA for these that it has to happen and you have to show that the kids haven't um, met that um, level of responsibility. So here are some questions. Should a, should a comprehensive um, problem solving team be called for Abby? Remember about Abby? She's not doing very well with her reading. She's missed school. She likes school. She likes the school she's in, but she's having difficulty in reading. Um, so would you think that a, 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 a comprehensive problem solving team should be called for Abby? Yeah. Who should come to the meeting? We know that Abby is, well right now she's in the respite, but let's either pretend like she's in the respite or pretend that she's at her new foster home. Who should come to the, to the problem solving team meeting? Not the grandmother. She's the uh, parents. Um, they're non-substantial compliance. So should they be invited? Yes. Okay. What about the rest of home staff? Yes, they should be invited. Or the foster home staff? Yes. Okay. What about the caseworker? Yes. What about the guardian ad litem? Yes. Right. They all can be invited, and they all should be invited, and they all should come. If an evaluation is to be completed, we kind of went over this, Debbie, who can sign the consent? Now remember, for the interventions that occur, no consent needs to be signed. That's why I encourage you all that you all can request that meeting, you all can request to have it and to look at some of the issues. But who can sign um, consent? Parents. Uh, parents, unless the judge is appointed, is said that they can't make educational decisions and whatever. And again, should the ESC evaluation be completed concurrently with RTI? I say yes. You need to uh, push schools along a little bit to do that because they really are in their heads brainwashed and I work in the school system, but you know, it's hard to move the system sometimes. You need to move it so that it's concurrent, but be aware that if you begin to look at some real specific learning disabilities, you might need a little bit longer on that RTI process than that 60 days. And so what would happen in that case? 
They would meet within the six, after the evaluation was done, if they don't have all the RTI data, they would make eligibility <coughs> decisions. Maybe the child would be eligible for something else, but they would deny eligibility for one of those three that we talked about if they need more information. And then they could come back in a month. They don't have to do new evaluations. They could come back in a month with new data and make an eligibility decision then. So it's not like you have to wait forever to have them come back. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is this uniform drugs here for any Should be. Right? It's law. Yeah. So it should be. Can the school share the information if you have a child that transitions sure. during that period of time? You can. You can. I mean, again, sometimes it feels like you've got to start over, but sure, if you have RTI and you're particularly in the same district, I would hope that, I mean, the same school district, I would hope that you could say this is the the, the interventions we're doing here, and this is how the child is doing. This is the level they were at here. Pick up the, the you know, pick up the mantle and go straight forward. I hope we wouldn't go back. Yes, they should do that. Yes. I just wanted to clarify, but um, then the child is prohibited from attending CPSD meetings. No. no. But you know, young kids generally don't because they don't understand. Them. It's a high school student. Surely, no, no. Parent, kids are never prohibited. Um, same kind of thing, you gifted, um, well what I would, it's interesting that's where you went, we could do a gifted eligibility and, and you could be evaluated, you probably wouldn't have to go through RTI for that. However, if you have doing well with, with standardized tests and doing poorly in school, you know, there's some kind of problem going on there. And so I would, again, want to go through the RTI process to look at organizational things, to look at processing. Or just to look at how this young lady learns. You know, maybe she learns by just sitting and listening and having it all come in, and 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 but she doesn't do well on homework and, and giving it back except in a written test. So, but yes, a gifted evaluation can be done. I'm sorry. Um, a gifted evaluation can be done. They usually do a checklist by the teachers and then do an evaluation, which is mainly an IQ, is all that they need. Okay, Part C, Early Intervention Service. The IDEA Individuals with Disabilities Act have two parts. You would think Part B would be for the young kids and Part C would be for the older kids. No. Part C is for the kids birth to three. And in the state of Florida, Part C is run by the Department of Health. There should be a provider. Sometimes it is school districts. In Broward, it is not. Most of the time, I think it is not. But um, there is a, a Part C provider, and um, they get money to evaluate, to screen, and to provide services. They are not, quote, educational services. They generally are in-home or in-clinic kind of services for children who have developmental delays, um, speech, autism, and those kind of things. Um, and then at three, which we'll talk about in a little bit, at three they transition to part B, which is the school districts are required to provide um, services for children with disabilities between the ages of three and 22, their 22nd birthday. Um, CACTA requires, and we put that in big print, for any child under the age of three to be who who's been involved um, in child abuse and neglect to be referred to early intervention services, which is Part C. Now, we often get, um, I, I, again, we don't do this, but I, in talking to the folks in our community who do it, um, we often get parent attorneys, and I know they're even here, but parent attorneys to, uh, that don't want kids evaluated, don't want that referral to happen, um, and I just, you all in your roles really need this to, 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 to occur. Because, I mean, they might do a screening and decide that there isn't anything, and that's great. But all of the research, and you know this as well as I, particularly for any kind of development delay, particularly for autism, particularly for anything, the earlier you start those interventions, the better. We all know that. So this, to me, should be the first priority on any GAL, on any surrogate, on any uh, CLS, is that what they are, attorneys? Um, you know, this really needs to happen. Because
Because if this can occur, and we're talking, you know, this can happen when they're six months old. This doesn't have to happen when they're walking and talking. These people do evaluations on these young kids, developmental evaluations. It needs to happen immediately. And maybe at that six-month evaluation, everything looks good, and then a year and a half later, we don't think so, refer them again. Because the soonest we can start getting services for these kids, the sooner the better. And this, this, is, this will help all the stuff that we know that Debbie talked about foster care kids. This about being behind and all of that, this can help if that early intervention can occur. So um, I really, I really encourage you that this really needs to happen for the, and I know that oftentimes the guardians, guardian alliance, and other folks are appointed even more when it's not 100% for those young kids because of that. So I really encourage you all, this really needs to occur. And we have a transition, like I said, when they turn three from part C to part B. I encourage you all to be involved in that. Usually there's a meeting between the Part C provider and the Part uh, B provider, the school district. Parents have to sign consent for the sharing of the information, again, whoever the parent is. Um, and, and then we do evaluations. The uh, Part B folks were required, <laughs> if the child meets eligibility requirements, to have an IEP developed and ready to go when they turn three. Broward happens to be, we're proud of this, we're 100% compliant with that happening. We have a good transition situation going, but you're required to have that IEP when they turn three. So you all need to, again, so when this kid's two and a half and they're getting Part C services, you need to be talking to people, encouraging people to get that going. Now, if they don't have Part C services, and the child is now, you know, almost three or three years and one month, then you refer directly to the school district under their, quote, child find. Most school districts have what they call a child find office. Child find is a legal term um, in the idea that we have a responsibility to find all children with disabilities within our district. And so we have to do reach out, outreach to to private schools and other kinds of places in the district. You know, we put brochures in the chief pediatrician's office, all those kinds of things. But if, in fact, you have a, a child, you, you know, make sure that you get that going so when that kid hits the ground at age three, they have an IEP in the school to go to. We're required to do that. Can we talk about that a little bit more for a minute? Under, under the child find, that's um, under statutory requirement. Right. Who's that? Who's yeah, I just like to see. Yes, it's a federal law and it's under statutory. Yes, federal what, law. What statute? So uh, it's, a, it's an education statute. Um, well, idea is um, I put some but, stat statutes in the back of here um, for you all to look at. Um, it would be under IDA, which is not here, which is um, 20 U.S.C. 1415. Um, and right around there, 14, 14, 14, 13, 12, and 14, they talk about all of it, and they talk about Part C during that time, too. Okay. And, and if you look at the state law the, the, and the regulations that are easier to find, if you go to um, the Florida Administrative Code, Chapter 6A-6, um, it, it's all in there. It's much easier to read than the statutes. It's all in there. It talks about pre-K. It talks about the transition from Part C to Part B. It's all in there. And there's a, I'm sorry, I'm That's right. there, there's a punishment section under that. If there, no, we don't get punished. We don't get punished. Well, um, no, right. Right. Let me tell you what would happen. Okay. If the district did not do that, the parent, whoever the parent might be, would be have um, their procedural safeguard rights to try to get the district to do it. They could file a state complaint. They could file due process. I mean, okay. if a district never did it, yes, there would be punishment. They would keep money away. But if we didn't do it on one occasion, if they didn't get there in time, I would try to work through the district, obviously. But you can file a state complaint. You can file a due process hearing. My, my question is more when the district is aware of it, has been court order that they need to investigate it, and then still refuse. Investigate what? It, that there is a child with disabilities that is in need of services from the school district. Yeah, 
Yeah, if they don't, I mean, there is this child find obligation all the way through. Now, let me tell you what the, you know, it's a little bit off topic, but we will. So let's say the court orders and says, we think this kid's disabled, and we want you to investigate. Let's say the kid's 12 or whatever. And they come to the school, and they look at the school, and the school looks at the kid, and the kid's getting average grades, and he's social, he gets along with everybody, he doesn't miss school, there just seems to be absolutely no problem at school. That school district, if you request as the parent or the judge, but the judge can't, um, I'll say it, the school district is not a party to the dependency case. So if we want to be real honest, I know we have a judge here, judges cannot order the school district to do anything. They can suggest, they can request, but they literally can't order us to do anything. Now what we do in Broward, if we get a court order that says evaluate this kid, we take that as a request for an evaluation. And we bring it back to the school, the school does their due diligence and figuring it out. But again, if we have a, so, so we look at all this, so we have this kid and we get this order that says, you know, um, evaluate this kid for ESA services. And we look and, you know, the kid gets along with everybody, the kids get good grades, there doesn't seem to be any problem at all in the educational environment. Remember, we're talking about the educational environment. We are required by law to give you what is called a notice of refusal. And the notice of refusal has to go, we are refusing to evaluate why, blah, 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 what did we review, all that kind of stuff. There's a, an, an idea, and you can look in those Florida, Florida Administrative Code guidelines um, and, and ask um, and look at what we're required to do. Thanks. Any time. Yes. Under Child Find, is there any um, partnership or, or system within DCF where they're actively um, trying to identify this? Yeah, we, we do in Broward, I'll be honest, I'm not totally on top of that, but yes. But first of all, there is a cooperative agreement on the state level between DOE and DCF and DJJ and all of those groups, probably ACA and all those folks are involved. But yes, there, we have a process, and Debbie might know more about it. We have a process in Broward. We have, we have a child find kind of hotline. And certainly DCF could call up and we take the information over the phone. We take the call no matter how old the kid is. So if the child is under three, we take all the information and we send it over to Children's Diagnostic and Treatment Center because they're the Part C provider. If the kid is three or over, we take it and we do we'll that initial referral. Anybody can make that initial referral to begin to look. Now, if we were going to end up doing an evaluation, we can do screenings without parent consent. So if a foster parent had a concern or a guardian lied, you could bring the child in for a screening and we could do that without parental consent. If we saw at that screening that there were enough um, red flags that we need consent, we would need to get the consent from the parent. And I would just point out, and I assume everybody knows this, but if they don't, Every circuit in the state has a DCF attorney who's the educational aid and work with their school board. So they should be able to call them. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean to return. Let's go back. Sorry. We are responsible for three, districts are responsible for three to 21 for screening and evaluation. And we are required to provide pre-K services by law for children with disabilities. So now sometimes districts can they make the child eligible for Part B for an IEP. Sometimes they contract contract out, and those kids go to private pre-K programs. The district might not have all of the pre-K programs or any of the pre-K programs themselves, but they are required to fund. Yes, ma'am. Yes. want to um, be technical about it, 
um, as a medical doctor would, okay? Um, we make kids eligible, and there is an eligibility called autism. For children under the age of six, there's an eligibility called developmental disabilities. And oftentimes with those young kids, when we aren't quite sure, they might have some autism um, tendencies or characteristics, but we don't know for sure. We will, um, we will make them eligible under DD, under developmental disabilities. We do all the same services. Remember, one of the things that you need to remember too is that once a child becomes eligible for ESC services, services, and Ann talked about this yesterday, services do not follow eligibility. Services are individually decided for the child. So a kid could have an, uh, other health impaired when they get older, they could have autism, they could have DD, they could have speech, but if they need counseling, they get counseling. If it, it's going to impact their education. You don't get specific services um, because you have a certain eligibility. Now there are services that we know work better for children with autism um, than, than other services. Our pre-K programs are all um, uh, a staff ratio of one teacher and an aide or two to every four children, three children. Um, and, you know, they need to be in language, what they call language enhanced, language, um, language, comprehensive language programs so that everybody's getting language and then we know language is a big problem with kids with autism. Um, so we don't diagnose. Um, but we, if, if an outside provider diagnosed a child with autism, we again would take that diagnosis, we would do an evaluation. A diagnosis, any diagnosis, again, doesn't necessarily make the child eligible. Remember, there are two tiers. Are we running out of time? Yeah. Third. Right. Um, 